you're listening to Bachi Talk FM, a podcast for facilities and workplace services professionals. My name is Bhaskar Sundaram and I'll be sitting down with the facilities and workplace industry leaders to share their stories, discuss their career and learn how to make an impact in the facilities industry. Today's guest is Martin Prickard, fellow Ricks, fellow IWFM. Martin's career in facilities began as a mailroom assistant in 1970. For nearly 50 years, he has worked as facilities manager, service provider, trainer, consultant in operational, strategic, and leadership roles. He has been the chief exec director and non-exec director of many facilities-related businesses and organizations, known to many as the FM Guru. He was involved in the creation of many of the building blocks of modern facilities management, including the AFM, IFMA UK, and the PIFM. Martin was twice president of the IFMA UK chapter and is a fellow of both IWFM and RICS. Martin has been a regular speaker and facilitated FM conferences around the world since the 1980s and a prolific writer of articles and white papers on facilities management. His What's FM's Do Mind Map has been used by many FM organizations, magazines, and educational establishments all over the world. Awards include seven from the British Institute of Facilities Management, includes two for FM journalism and being named by the FM world as one of the top FM pioneers. In 2015, he received the BIFM's Lifetime Achievement Award for his contribution to the FM profession. 2016, PFM Magazine gave him their Lifetime Achievement Award for his contribution to the facilities industry. Martin is now semi-retired dividing his time between consultancy work for selected client charitable activities and creating new poetry and art. Welcome to Bachi Talk FM, Martin. Great to have you with us. Thank you, Bachi. Long <laughs> intro. It's a long life. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely, but it all began during your birth. So let's talk about where were you born, Martin, and your high school and education? Uh, born... born Born in North London, Islington, um, but uh, post-war, so 1954. Um, so we were living in, um, you know, the, uh, the, the the remain, you know, what left of North was not of North North London after the Blitz. Um, so, uh, like many people, we were relocated out of London, supposedly to a temporary estate. Um, in Hertfordshire out in Watford, which is where I grew up. Um, that temporary estate, of course, is still there. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's um, so we were living on this estate of Londoners, but in the Hertfordshire countryside. It was a bit odd, I suppose, in some ways. Um, education. Um, my first school was wonderful, I had these inspirational teachers um, and they really got me hooked on reading and words and theatre and music and the arts. Um, but I was stupid enough to uh, pass the 11 plus and got sent to a grammar school, which was several miles away, a bus and a train journey. Um, all my peers, all, all my schoolmates went to the local comprehensive, but I had to go off to this grammar school. Um, and that didn't work for me at all. Um, that, they made it very clear that people of my class weren't uh, expected at grammar school. Um, and um, once I knew they didn't really want me there, I didn't want to be there either. So uh, there, there wasn't much learning went on there. Um, and I left school without any qualifications. Um, but I mean, when people ask me about my education, I don't talk about the schools. I talk about what I've done during my life. You know, I, I decided that I didn't need school to teach me stuff I'd teach myself. So I read and I read and I read and I read and I still do today. And I go to conferences and listen to webinars and podcasts. And, you know, I've, I've taught myself somewhere along the way I did, um, I did a, a business studies degree because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. Um, but I have to say, you know, I was taken to one side, I started to do a master's in FM, but I was taken to one side by um, the managing director of, of the company I was working for at the time who said, you're not doing this to learn anything. You're just doing it for the, for the degree, for the qualification. And you know all this stuff. You're at the stage in work where 
what you do and what you know is much more important than qualifications and grades and things. Mm-hmm. Concentrate on that. And actually, you know, that's that that was um I think chasing the qualification was about me fit with that chip on my shoulder from those grammar school days. Um, so yeah, I've I've learned and I continue to learn. I'm one of those curious people who constantly have the iPad in the hand when watching TV and somebody says something and I think that's interesting and I look it up. <laughs> <laughs> and before iPads, I used to have an encyclopedia and I'd always be looking things up. Mm. I think, you know, curiosity is a great thing to have in FM. Definitely, Martin. What a, what a, what an early start. So do you remember your very first job, Martin? What was it? Um, well, I had lots and lots of, um, of, of, of part-time jobs as, 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 a, a, as, as a youngster. You know, um, whether there was a bit of an entrepreneur in there, you know, I set up the car washing round. I did leaflet delivering. I set up a, an alternative tuck, tuck box at school because I thought that t- the stuff they sold at school was too expensive and I could get it cheaper. And so <laughs> I was a bit of a, an entrepreneur then. But my first proper job after school, um, I thought I could probably make a living by, you know, writing poetry and going to music festivals. But my dad said I needed to um, to do a proper job. So he he worked for the post office and he got me signed up for the post office headquarters up in London. And I found myself in the mail room. Um, and uh, it was okay. Um, Long haired, spotty faced teenager, age 15. Mm-hmm. Um, but the... Um, yeah, it, it, uh, before long, I got frustrated because I thought the guy around the mailroom was an idiot. Um, so I worked hard until I got his job. And then I thought the guy he worked for was an idiot. <laughs> and that was pretty much the story of my career. <laughs> sure, Martin. From mailroom, uh, what brought you to the facilities industry? Talk us through the journey. Well... I mean, it's interesting you use the word industry, and I'm always really picky with people. Do you mean the facilities industry, i.e. the service providers who provide those services commercially, or do you mean the facilities profession, mm-hmm. um, which is an entirely different thing, or do you mean the world of facilities services, which includes all of our cleaners and mailroom assistants? So okay. if, if you mean into facilities, 1970, I was in facilities, pushing a wheelbarrow around with mail on. Mm. Um, facilities management, my first step into management, came a few years later. Um, I, From the mail room, I went to work in a safety department, post office safety department, um, which doing safety statistics for, a, for an organization that employed 300,000 people in the days before computers. That was a lot of paperwork. <laughs> the, um, uh, and then um, when I was ready to move into, into management, um, I foolishly, I said I'd like to go into personnel, a mm. human resources, called personnel then, um, because I thought it would be about people. And I was fed up with shuffling all these bits of paper around in health and safety. But I discovered personnel was about shuffling bits of paper around as well, and not about people either. Um, so I went to see the personnel manager and I said, look, I'm really not happy here. There's a guy who walks around the clipboard chatting to the secretary, with a clipboard chatting to the secretaries, the accommodation officer. Um, I want one of those jobs. And she said, no, 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 no. The people who look after the buildings and services and stuff, that's just where we put people who aren't any good at anything else. And I said, well, actually, I think I'd quite like to do that. So that was it. And I found myself round peg, round hole. Um, and I just loved being in, working as a facility, what we now know as a facilities manager, then called an accommodation officer. Um, and, um, you know, one minute dealing with the, the postmaster general on the top floor, next minute down sorting out the chauffeurs in the in in the basement. It was it was great problem solving, dealing with people, 
and that's what FM is. Um, in terms of FM industry, that came a few years later um, when I moved from customer side to supply side. Um, so from post office in-house FM, um, accommodation management, um, became a building manager. Um, then the post office, I don't know if you recall, no, you won't recall, you're too young. Um, the post office and BT were all one organization then. Um, and they split and I took the option to go with BT um, and I moved out to Suffolk um, where um, I uh, looked after a number of buildings, managed some big relocations. At that time, BT was going through one of those phases of moving people out of London. Um, and um, then from there, I got the opportunity to, um, to move back to London to join an organization called Cellnet, which was the first mobile phone company. Um, and my boss at the time told me not to throw away my career on a crazy idea like telephones with no wires. Why would anybody want to walk about in the street talking on the telephone? Don't waste your career on this thing. It's, it's a five minute wonder. Um, as you know, he was wrong. <laughs> I moved back um, and I became a uh, facilities manager um, for Cellnet, which at that point had about 40 staff. Um, and then I left some 12 years later, um, by which time we had 40,000 staff and umpteen million customers and mobile phones were everywhere. Um, and I was looking at, so I had kind of the same job in an organization that tripled in size every year for 12 years. Um, so uh, by the end, I was property and facilities director um, with you know millions of square feet of office space, 800 shops, 17,000 radio stations, 20 computer centers, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a big old job. Mm. And that's when I moved supply side. Um, uh, and I joined um, a friend of mine, Oliver Jones, and it, with a, 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 a new FM business called Cytex. Um, and um, that uh, we were selling um, uh, management FM. So we effectively we we were we were um, managing agents. Um, so we were white collar FM, sub subcontracting the services or buying the services on on Trans behalf. And it's interesting how you know. I need to skip back just a little bit. You know that journey. You know the post office. Everything was in house. I was managing an in house team all the time. Um, time I moved into BT, we were outsourcing services, but single service. Um, Time I went to Cellnet, I'd got the idea that actually operating all of these as separate services was, was silly and I needed to bring them together as a single team. So although they worked, my, my service providers worked for different employers, we operated as a single team, team meetings, all of that. Uh, and then I moved to Cytex and we were into managed, managed FM, managed services, where we managed all the services on behalf of clients like um, Cisco and Microsoft. Um, and that was a really, really big learning curve for me. Firstly, moving supply side and realizing what a bad customer I'd been some of the time. Because <laughs> I, I, I strongly advise anybody in FM who's a supplier to spend some time working as a customer and who's a customer to spend some time working as a supplier because you really need to understand both sides of this world. Um, but the other thing about Cytex was I was looking after contracts in um, Hong Kong, Portugal, Spain, France, um, jumping on and off of planes. I mean, it was very exciting. Um, mm -hmm. And then ultimately uh, that business was sold to Carillion. Uh, I moved to uh, Reliance, which was a big security company getting into facilities management, helped to set up their facilities business. Um, 
which ultimately merged into Norlands, which is now CBRE. Yep. There's always a family tree around in, in, um, in FM. Um, so I was CEO there. Um, and interestingly, I ended up managing B the BT estate again because Reliance were a partner in Monterey, which at the time was the biggest ever um, outsourced FM contract, 125 million a year, massive deal. Um, and then when I left there, uh, I, um, I set up FM Guru as a consultancy business, advice, support, and inspiration to the world of FM. And we did training and consultancy and all sorts of good stuff. And did that for about 20 years. Um, still do it a few days a month now. Sure, Martin. I think that was yeah. a long CV, wasn't it? And no, Martin, I mean, like the way you summarized your 50 odd career in like 15 minutes is unbelievable. And, but over these years, Martin, as you rightly said, I know the question of what is in FM, it's still, you know, we, we are still not clear for that answer. I mean, like, what is FM? And uh, 50 years down the line from your experience, we're still trying to find the answer. So you might have seen the gradual evolution of what we call as a single service, bundled service, IFM, IFS, technology, et cetera, et cetera. Just talk us through how was FM before and how was how is FM currently being evolved into what it is today? Um, you see, I, I don't think FM has changed. Mm. F FM um, is providing um, places and services for organizations in order to help them achieve what they exist for. Mm. That was the same in 1970 mm. as it is today. Mm. That hasn't changed. You know, what's changed have been... Um, uh the uh the manner we procure it um the the uh sophistication of our management systems the the scope has definitely grown um and the um and technology of course has a has has a, has a major part to play and has done all the way through my my five decades um i this is a good point to mention the mind map um way back trying to explain to people about what fm is um and you've seen the mind map mm. yeah my mind yeah um the I'll, I'll 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 make sure to send you a one that you can attach to this or something sure um the um trying to explain to people what fm is you know the the idea that as a facilities manager now not what fm is what fms do trying to explain that as a facilities manager, we look after catering, cleaning, maintenance, security. And to do that, we do management, administration, strategy, stakeholder management, risk. You know, these are all, all things that we do. Each of those are specialists in their own right. You can be a specialist caterer, you can be a specialist safety person. But the facilities manager has to be a person who knows enough about all of those things to be able to coordinate and integrate and develop them into a strategic solution that enables the organization that they're doing that for to succeed in mm. whatever it is. And that doesn't matter whether you're in-house or out, you know, that's, that's got nothing to do with it. The role of FM is exactly the same, you know. Um, and, um, so I drew this very simple chart with like those six things in. And then gradually over the years, I kept adding things. Um, and for about, I think I started it in 1996, just after I'd been on a training course for about how to do mind mapping. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, and just like every few months, I seem to be adding something as people told me about others. Services, the services we look after have definitely grown. You know, catering, cleaning, maintenance, security, they were there in 1970. And a bit of, and a bit of um, workplace design and, and the like. But over the years, so many things got added to our remit uh, because 
ac businesses actually got the hang of it. I don't know whether it was lazy or, 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 or wisdom, but if you have a role that is capable of managing multiple disciplines, mm. then it almost doesn't matter what those disciplines are. Yeah, let's give him estates. Yeah, let's give him give him project management. Yeah, let's give him business continuity. Yeah, let's give him um, because it's all the same thing. You know, our job is to bring all of those uh, services that support an organization, property, estates, to bring them together in search of that key magic bit of strategy that helps the organization to succeed. Um, and I, again, you know, it's um, as an old man, it, uh, it, it shocks me every time I hear some younger facilities manager who's just had the light bulb moment come on who realizes that's what we do. Because <laughs> um, they thought they were about looking after buildings and we were never about looking after buildings. We were about helping organizations to succeed. That's always what we've been about. Um, but how we do it has changed over the decades. Um, I, I did a um, I did a talk uh, uh, a few years ago for um, uh, one of the IWFM regions about you know kind of how I saw the five decades um, of, of of my work in life, um, and I, that there are similarities all the way through. Um, Although there's evolution, some things are exactly the same. Mm. You know, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the noughties, um, not in the 10s and not in the 20s yet, we had recessions. Mm. Those recessions drove a lot of what we do because facilities management, or rather the occupation and management of buildings is for almost every organization the second highest cost after staff. So in a recession, it's the first place the finance director comes to try and make a saving. Mm -hmm. So we've always been about, you know, it's never not been about, possibly during the noughties, it's never not been about, can we do it for a better price? Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I don't mean the noughties, the teens. The teens was the uh, 2010 to 2020. Hmm. I don't know if you know that was the first that was the first decade there was an 11 year period there without a recession and that was the first the longest peacetime period without a recession since before the Napoleonic Wars wow um, it so we really did see something different during that period you know, and it's interesting that it's during that period we saw a lot of focus on things like wellness and because for once we weren't quite so worried about the money. Mm. COVID's knocked us back 10 years on that, unfortunately. That's right. Do, um, do you want me to go through the decades? If you can, quickly. Yes, but really smart. <laughs> I will do it as quickly as I can. Um, so 1970s, um, 1970s, you know, look up any history book. It will talk to you about recession, strikes, inflation, um, all kinds of chaos. The three day week um, during, during the energy crisis um, and, and the, uh, the strikes that were taking place, the government announced that no workplace could be open for longer than three days a week. Um, and uh, we had regular power cuts every day. There were times you knew what time your power cut was coming. At the time, I'm looking after a 36 story building and there's gonna be power cuts. <laughs> um, I walked up and down the flights of stairs in that building an awful lot during that period. Um, but the working life was pretty much unchanged from the 1950s. You know, we still had we still had people coming in, you know, in 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 towel coats. Um, we we still had solicitors in our office wearing gowns. Um, we um, 
you know, the big old typing pool with the girls with the, with, with the big typewriters. Remember, again, no computers. Um, so we had this huge economic and operational challenge and yet um, organizations were stuck in a previous decade. And so those of us involved with the management of buildings, um, you know, we, we had quite a challenge. You know, there was this status driven world where people would, you know, tell you about, you know, the seniority they'd reached, which meant that they were entitled to a square yard of carpet. Um, and then at the same time, you're trying to work out how to reduce costs in order to deal with this, this massive recession. It was a very difficult time. And that led to the creation of facilities management, as we know it. Um, uh, organizations like Herman Miller, um, uh, academics like Franklin Becker over in the States, um, they started to talk about this thing, facility management. Um, and in 1979, that led to the creation of the IFMA. I got really, really excited about that. You know, what we were doing had a name, it, it, it was a profession. Um, but that came out of this focus on how can we make our offices work better? How can we make our workplaces work better? And it's very much driven by the furniture industry. Then we switched to the 80s. What happened in the 80s? Recession, strikes, <laughs> social turmoil, um, Thatcher years, compulsory outsourcing. Um, so, uh, so again, you know, we're, we're, we're back to, um, okay, we've got to find ways to reduce costs. Mass outsourcing, some of it um, in search of uh, cost reduction. And of course, you, you never actually get real cost reduction by outsourcing. You get risk transfer and other benefits. Um, but also, um, outsourcing by um what's the word doctrine you know the thatcherite doctrine of you know compulsory outsourcing everything must go you mustn't um, which fell over into the city and the guys in the red braces in the city were valuing businesses by headcount divided by turnover efficiency ratio so that meant that if you outsourced your staff even if it cost you more to buy them in from from some outsourced provider, you increase the value of your shares in your, in your company because you made your company more efficient. Crazy, crazy times, um, all driven by that, you know, those, that Thatcherite doctrine. Of course, the other thing that was happening in, in the 1980s was computers. Um, all of a sudden, we had to fit computer rooms into our buildings with air conditioning and raised floors and cabling our buildings hadn't been designed for that because um, we hadn't had any of that in the 1970s. You had windows you could open and radiators. Um, nobody had ever thought about trying to cool down buildings before, not in, not in the UK. Um, so that was, a, that was a big, big change. Um, of course, mobile phones were invented in the 1980s as well, which <laughs> ties in with part of my journey. Although at that stage, they were only in the hands of the uh, the yuppies in the city um, and cost of fortune. 1990s recession, um, uh, which brought in 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 in, in Blair um, mass unemployment. Um, again, the uh, uh, technology moved on a real pace. Then we started to see PCs appearing. We had to fit them on every desk. So that meant we needed new kinds of furniture, cable tidying, um, uh, mobile working became a, an opportunity, um, uh, hot desking became an opportunity. Mm. Um, outsourcing started to look at things like, you know, you know, we started to see the emergence of TFM. Um, and Lennox Martin talked last time about John Jack forming Procord, the first white collar TFM. Um, so, service provider um and um yeah 1990s were oh and and of course the millennium bug which which called us all kept us all really busy for a couple of years to, towards the end there um the 2000s um what happened in the 2000s biggest recession since lord knows when 
Um, uh, but also um, globalization. So we started to see the first big international contracts. Um, uh, broadband started to enable proper homeworking, which had never been we'd never been able to do before. Um, the FM market, we started to get the what I now call the Premier League. You know that kind of top ten of billion pound players. There'd never been billion pound players before. Um, they, they started to emerge in, in the, uh, at the turn of the century. Um, the 2010s, um, as I've said, first peacetime period without a recession. Um, uh, green became mainstream. We started talking about office quality, wellness. And I think it's because that, 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 that imperative that money came first it actually started to come second for a lot of people. Mm. Now it's difficult because the big FM providers um, had mortgaged their grannies during during the recession of the, the late noughties. Um, and they were spinning plates all over the place on tiny, tiny margins. And of course that drove the market right down. So although the customer didn't have um, the same imperative around cost, service providers were finding it really hard to uh, to compete and then eventually we started to see the plate start to topple and organizations like um like carillion came tumbling down um and uh um you know that takes us that takes us up to the 2020s and you know now the 2020s of course are going to be defined by covid and what happens after that in the future there's my quick 50 years of fm for you <laughs> Thank you, Martin. That's fascinating. Martin, during these years, you not only worked for the service providers and also for the buyers, you also were instrumental with uh, creating or being part of the industry bodies, Martin. Talk us through about uh, IFMA. You mentioned it was started in 1979, but you were also chief executive of IFMA. The RICS, the IWFM, Pattern Makers, Amuse. Uh, and I, I, I'm just getting familiar with all these industry bodies. <laughs> Um, why can't there be one industry body? Why there are so many? Uh, anyway, that's a different question. But talk us through the evolution of these industry bodies as well, please, Martin. Well, as I say, if IFMA emerged as the, in 1979, it was the National Facilities Management Association of America. Um, but very quickly, overseas people started joining it. And uh, I think it was 81, I think they changed the name to International. Um, so those, those of us not in America were able to join. Um, and that was very much about, um, you know, the dawn of a new era. Um, and then um, I, I mentioned Franklin Becker as being the academic in the, the USA who, who really worked with Steel, Steelcase and Miller to produce that, 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 that first body to represent the uh, the, the profession. Um, here in the UK, there was uh, Frank Duffy, um, who uh, a renowned architect and leader of, 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 of um, thought leader in our world. Um, and he took those those ideas and, and he started talking about it and writing about it. He set up a magazine here in the UK called Facilities. Um, and uh, on the back of that, a group of us got together and said, why don't we form something here? And we formed the 1985, four or five, we formed the Association of Facilities Management. 35 of us got mm -hmm. together and form, formed that. Um, and we had the vision then that we, we discussed a lot then, and it's interesting with hindsight now, you say about, you know, why don't we only have one body? You know, we discussed a lot then, why don't, should we just be a chapter of IFMA? We said, no, 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 we're British, we're gonna do something different. Um, should we go and join the RICS? And we said, no, 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 because, you know, they're, they're, all, they're all exclusive and you've got to have a degree and, and um, we want to be inclusive and different. We want everybody working in FM, whether they've got a degree or not, whether they're a, a, a facilities coordinator in the, in the smallest office. We want them all to be able to join and be part of this movement. So that was the vision behind the AFM. 
you know, the last thing in the world we ever wanted to be was chartered or, or you know, like any of those old fuddy daddy. We were new and modern. Mm. Um, uh, BIFM came 10 years later with the merger of BIFM and IFM. IFM was a, another um, organization that grew up within the Institute of Administrative Management. They had a subgroup for facilities managers um, and B AFM and IFM merged, forming the BIFM. Um, and uh, just carried on really from where we were under some great leaders. Um, we really got out there and started hammering on the doors of, um, of, of the universities and academics saying, you know, you've got to teach facilities management. I, I was the chair of the education committee for the AFM for, 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 for a while. Um, and I remember I went the rounds of all the universities, it seemed to me in the UK talking to them trying to persuade them it to, to, to start something for facilities management. Um, but it was several years later and through BIFM before that actually happened. Um, the shift to IWFM, I guess I'm with, I'm with some of my other older generation on that. I'm not sure that was the right move. I think the implication that workplace is not part of facilities management, whereas it is and always has been. Um, I think that's not helpful when we're already confused over what is a facilities manager. Correct. Um, uh, and their, their, their intent on going for chartership, which just, again, we lose that original vision. And, and I'm not sure why we need to do that when, if you want to be a chartered FM, you already can through RICS. Mm. Um, and uh, there's some, RICS for me is for the leaders, the real senior people, you know, who, who, who want, who are gonna sit at board level, who are gonna gain that respect and credibility that membership of an organization like RICS brings. BIFM, wasn't for those people. BIFM was for the ordinary FM and facilities assistant. But hey, mm. younger people with brighter, completely functional brains are driving this stuff now and I'm quite happy for them to get on and do it. And I'm sure they'll do um, a fantastic job. Um, we, we did at one stage, a guy called Derek Paxman. He and I got really worked up about all these different bodies, because there's also SIBC and um, uh, the Institute of Engineers and, and you know, all these diff other bodies. And, and we say, you know, why we don't have a voice. Construction and facilities management, sorry, facilities management, depending on your definition, 120 billion pound industry, employing around three and a half million people, 8% of gross domestic product. Um, doesn't have a voice in Parliament, doesn't, you know, th 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 there's nobody there. We're not noticed. Yes. Um, we sadly no longer have a, 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 a trade body. We used to have a trade body, the FMA, that went. So we don't have a trade association. Um, and we felt that we really need someone to talk on behalf of FM. But we set up this thing called Action FM which was going to purely be about promoting the cause of FM. Um, and we went around all the organizations and we pitched this idea to them. And they all said, no, no. And, and, then, and, and, then, and then we got one of them to say yes. So then we went back round again saying, we really think you should come because they're coming. <laughs> and so they said, well, we better come to keep an eye on them. And then we went somewhere else and said, we really think you would have come because those two are coming. Mm -hmm. And eventually we got them all around the table, which felt like a victory, but actually it didn't work because they were all there with the wrong reasons. They were all there to stop the, each other from Correct. doing anything useful. Yes. Um, wrong agendas. You know, they've got their agendas are all about their own growth, their own survival, their own strategic plans. 
they're not about what I'm passionate about, the world of facilities management. Right. Um, so that didn't last long, but we had a go. Mm -hmm. Maybe the new generation will have another go. Yes, Martin, because as a newcomer to the industry myself, that was one thing that, that was heartbreaking for me, which is like, you know, there was, it's, an, it's a long effort of 40 years of so many people, but for the past few years, it's been taken in a complete different direction. And uh, especially when, when COVID kind of brought FM as the front part of defending uh, citizens from COVID, I mean, like FM was integral and having a lack of industry body, having a lack of trade body status kind of made, we missed the chance of elevating ourselves up. But uh, that's uh, that's the sad story. But uh, pattern makers, talk about pattern makers, Martin. <laughs> the pattern makers, um, I mean, pattern makers is about charity. Mm. The, the pattern maker, the worshipful company of pattern makers is an ancient livery company of the city of London. Mm. Um, and... Uh, Way back in medieval times, all the trades in the city of London had a livery company. Um, mm. And the livery company meant that you had proved, being a, being a livery man meant that you had proved that you were good at your job, um, that your work was a, of a high quality, your ethics were of a high standard, and therefore you would be allowed to work in the city of London. Mm. Um, and if you didn't have that, or if your work failed, um, then you could go to the nearest city up the road, which happened to be Coventry, which is why people are told they're sent to Coventry if they, um, if, if they don't do well. So these organizations were trade associations, effectively. Um, but over the years since then, um, and pattern makers have been around for 800 years, um, over the years since then, Nobody makes patterns anymore. Patterns were like a, uh, 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 an undershoe that you put underneath your fancy silk shoes to walk through the streets of London because the streets of London were flowing with unmentionable stuff. Mm. Um, uh, so of course, nobody's had to make those things for, for, for quite a while because the worshipful company of paviors sorted that out. Um, so this organization doesn't have a, a historic um, body anymore. Facilities management was a new profession. Um, and uh, the people who, under the, under the Royal Charter for the Worshipful Company of Patent Makers, because that is a chartered organization, um, there's a minimum membership and uh, there was a point where the membership dropped very low and gentleman called Ian Scar Hall, who, you, who was in FM, who, who owned uh, GS Hall, very well-known M&E service provider. He, he had the vision that actually we could take facilities management into the patent makers and um, we could bolster their numbers, which is good for the patent makers, but it would give us a livery company. Um, and uh, so, since the mid 1980s, there have been um, a small community of facilities people within the patent makers, um, and we we network, we have nice dinners, we have good events. Um, much more importantly, we raise funds for good causes mm. um, and uh, use the uh, the power and might of the facilities industry to help those good causes occur. So recently we've been working on a project to um, refurbish uh, uh, an unused corridor um, at the Defence Medical Rehabilitation Centre to turn it into a community lounge for rehabilitating servicemen. Um, and we've got organisations like Mighty giving their services for free um, or, or, or at least cost. We've got um, architects and Quantities of ayers like, like like BWA giving their um, their services pro bono. So yes, we raise money, but we've also got people doing stuff. And you know why not do good? Mm -hmm. um, we um, we spend a lot of time trying to make money, um, but actually we can we can make life better for people too. Wow, brilliant, uh, 
definitely. And thank you for inviting me to the recent pattern makers. It was a blessing to see. Well, love it. Love the idea of getting you in 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 the, in the company. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So uh, now the industry bodies are done. And as you rightly said, 2010 to two, early 2020 was a blessing for all of us. Uh, no recession, nothing. COVID came, changed everything. Two years, two and a half years now, we are still talking about it. So, and I'm sure FM as an industry, yes, they are the unsung heroes. They keep people moving. They keep building safe. They do so many things, as you rightly said, which is not even defined by what an FM needs to do. So in COVID, people went and did a lot more uh, than what they did as well. So what have you observed lately during this COVID times? that inspired you any any stories of kindness any inspiring stories shout outs that you want to give martin i'm not sure i'd want to name anyone because everybody did such an amazing 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 job when mm. um when the media understandably you know was was focusing on the nursing you know cleaners security guards engineers, caterers were performing miracles. Mm. Um, I talked with um, uh, one of the NHS estates directors who, who told me that they'd, that they'd built a new they'd built a new triage centre. Um, they'd already had the plans to do it and and under the plans it was going to take them nine months to do it and they did it in three weeks. Um, and it's just, Miracles were, were were pulled out, and people were working. You know, while much of the population, all the population, if you believe the BBC, but um, much of the population was sat at home watching daytime TV. Um, security guards, cleaners, engineers, facilities managers were still working and working huge shifts and long, long, long hours, exposing themselves. I mean the I don't know if you saw the stats, the, the profession with the second highest mortality rate um, or the group of people with the second highest mortality rate from COVID were male security guards. Mm. Um, now that's horrifying. Mm. Um, uh, I, um, I, I went to um, the annual conference of um, OCS and all, uh, a, a company that, that 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 I do some work for, um, and we 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 saw a film at their 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 annual management conference. You know, lots of people and what they did, but then we finished the film in silence, watching the scroll go up of the people, the people who had died during the during the pandemic. And you know, we we really must not forget those people, and the shift that everybody brought in. And I, you know. The we, the leaders in FM, really, really, really owe it to all of our people. You know, that if people, if anywhere, people have started to recognize that maybe we're our caterers, cleaners, engineers, security guards, and FMs are actually quite important. <laughs> we have to keep that visibility. We have to shout about it. We have to make much more noise um, and blow our own trumpets. Um, and, and that's something that we've never been that good at. The FM service providers, of course, were a bit better at it than the in-house people. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at their, all their annual, I'm, I'm collecting all their annual reports as they come to an you know, their 2020 annual reports, because they're all full of great stories um, about, about what, what we've done. It reminds me a bit of the uh, of the three day week back in the nineteen seventies. You know, people saying this has never happened before, but you know, it was like then. You know, everybody was at home on those the, the days. But my team weren't. My my engineers were still in. My security guards were still in. I was still still in um, because the buildings had to be kept secure. They had to be kept running. Remember, we had the IRA bombing. You know. In, in in London every other week during that period. We couldn't leave our buildings empty just mm. because the power wasn't on. So we, you know, our guys kept working. And that's what happened during COVID. Um, there's a message we have to get across that FM 
might be non-core, but it's never non-essential. Mm. Um, when I was at Cellnet, there was a, a very uh, a, a day that sticks in my mind. I was in the senior leadership team um, and I turned up for a meeting one day at 11 o'clock, which I was told was the start time. And when I got there, the room was you know, full and there were papers everywhere and half empty coffee cups. And they'd clearly been there for some time. And I said, what's going on? I thought the meeting started at 11. And the guy said, sorry, Martin, we had some core business we needed to talk about. And my blood was boiling. <laughs> And I, you know, you big telephone network, me big power switch, mm. non-core or non-essential. Mm. Um, yeah, we we uh, we keep the the world running. Sorry, well, rant. <laughs> no, Martin, I think what a beautiful way of. I think we we all need to have the pride of who we are. Uh, otherwise, others will put their perception of who we are. I think it's important to to have that line. And uh, what a what what a, what a statement that you have. I think we talked a lot about the career. We talked a lot about FM uh, Martin. Let's end part one with this question, and we begin part two in a minute. So, uh, tell us three things not many people know about you, Martin. Um. Well, I guess I'll, I'll talk about one which encompasses others, I guess. Um, I don't know how many people know that I've, I've, I've got Parkinson's disease now. Um, I, um, I've known for, for, for a few years. Um, I've never made a secret of it, but I haven't gone out of my way to tell people. Um, it... Um, It's a, you know, it's, it doesn't change who I am, just what I can do. <laughs> um, and it's the reason why I'm, 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 I'm now, I'm now semi-retired. I, um, I, I suffered a couple of times during my life with, with, with um, some very bleak periods of depression, mental health issues. Um, and about five years ago, I started to feel um, that maybe that, that was happening to me again but there were other things going on um uh i'd lost my sense of smell my walk was different um i was having difficulty sleeping um there were a number of, of, of things that that alarmed my wife um and um she took me to the gp and he suspected parkinson's then after a long a couple of years um I finally got diagnosed, which was a relief, in fact, when it happened. Um, one of the things, you know, people don't know about Parkinson's is there is no easy test. You know, there's no blood test or, or, or brain scan that says you've got Parkinson's. There's a, there's a, a, a group of symptoms that you may display and they go through the process of eliminating any other thing that might cause those symptoms. And if, if, if you haven't got any of those other things, then you must have Parkinson's. Um, and um, although I've got a bit of a tremor now, which is the thing everybody knows about Parkinson's is tremor. Um, there are lots of other symptoms and um, tiredness, depression, anxiety, um, uh, aches and pains, um, all sorts of stuff. Um, that were starting to make it difficult for me to, to work at the pace that I'd been working. Um, so uh, two years ago, um, my wife and I decided, right, you know, we're, we're going to, we sold her, we closed down her business. Um, I, I decided I was going to semi-retire and then COVID came along. <laughs> so, so I was one of those people who got to sit at home watching daytime TV. And during that, I started writing poetry, which I hadn't done since I was a teenager, um, and um, doing a bit of art. And um, I've lived in this really, really different life now. And uh, because of COVID, I'm not sure, you know, back to your question was, you know, what do people not know about me? Because I haven't been seeing people, I don't know if people know. Uh, I don't even know if people know that I'm kind of retired, let alone that, that, that um, I've, I've got a neurodegenerative 
disease, but um, it's mm. so this was an opportunity to tell a few people. So thank you for that opportunity. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for sharing. I think uh, that closes part one of the episode and we'll come back and talk a lot more about Martin at the personal level in part two. Thank you. So welcome back to part two, Martin. Again, we discussed a lot about your early life career, how FM was for 50 years from 1970s all the way to 2020s. We also talked about the industry bodies. We also talked about um, how FM as a profession was impacted in COVID and bits and pieces in part one. Now let's go back and know a little bit more about you in person, some fun questions with rapid random fire and bits and pieces. Martin, are you ready? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. So Martin, obviously a fascinating life so far. So let's ask some first things. What's the best and worst purchases you have made in your life so far? Wow, best and worst purchases. Mm. Um, 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 my, I can't, I don't know about my whole flipping life, but, 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 but right now, mm. my, my iPad mm. goes with me everywhere. The mm -hmm. iPad is just, it, it's such a magnificent bit of technology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can, I can, I can write on it. I can draw on it. I can watch TV on it. I can research stuff on it. Yeah. And, and again, you know, I go back to, you know, we didn't have PCs. We didn't have, blimey, we didn't have electronic calculators when I started work. You know, they were manual and mechanical. You had to oil them. <laughs> And now you've got this thing in the palm of your hand that, that, that gives you the world um, of, of information. That's, 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 that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, worst purchase. Um, worst purchase. Worst purchase. Uh, um, I think I probably bought, I think I probably bought far too much technology when it was new before mm. waiting to find out <laughs> before waiting to find out whether Betamax was going to be better than VHS or not <laughs> <laughs> I love a bit I love a bit of tech so I'll buy something new and then of course a year later I want the new the new version because what I've got actually doesn't work very well cool. I've probably wasted a lot of money on that over the years but yes. I like I like tech <laughs> being an early adopter you're right martin i think we do go with the swing so martin if you could change one thing about or if you if you can create one rule that everybody should follow in this world what rule would you create martin oh um it's got to be something about kindness mm. be kind Mm. be kind i don't think it needs any any, any more to say than that the the we we move forward it seems it seems to me you know and and and, and it's very um it's very now for people to rage about social justice and the 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 injustices in the world today. And I'm not saying there aren't injustices in the world today. You know, in my great grandfather's time, um, uh, there was, you know, there were far more injustices. In my grandfather's time, women didn't have the vote, um, you know, couldn't own houses. Um, in my father's time, um, in, in, in the seventies, in my time, you know, racism and sexism were not illegal um, and were everyday and commonplace occurrences of in the worst possible kind. Um, we have moved on um, and yet every now and then, you know, perhaps during the Thatcher years, perhaps mm -hmm. during the Johnson years, um, mm -hmm. the, um, we seem to step back a bit and we seem to forget um, to be kind. Mm. To, to to find ways to be fair, um, the um, 
we got to have hope and we got to keep 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 moving forward well said martin beautiful martin i know we all are locked down pretty much some people are starting to travel but if you could visit any place in the world right now where would you choose to go and why here <laughs> i here home i uh -huh. spent I spent 50 years at work. <laughs> I spent 50 years jumping on and off of planes, driving up and down motorways, going all over the world, um, spent doing 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 18 hour days, working weekends. Um, and for me, the best place in the world is here in the Bedfordshire countryside with my wife and my dog on a sunny day. Um, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Mm, nice, Martin. Totally. Martin, what takes you out of your comfort zone? Out of my comfort zone? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what? Anything that is an FM is out of my comfort zone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, um, it's, again, you know, starting this new life where, yeah. where I'm only doing a few days a, a, a month and the rest of the time I'm Martin Bigard. Mm. Um, I... I literally went through a period where I couldn't work out who I was because if I'm not the FM guru if I'm not Martin Pickard doing doing FM mm. I'm teen hours a day every day of the week mm. I didn't quite know who I was mm. um and uh yeah it, it it I also like everybody I suppose you know have the, have a bit of that imposter syndrome thing so some of the nice things that have happened, you know, like getting those awards that you talked about, um, like um, becoming a fellow at the RICS or some of the things I've done with the pattern makers, you know, meeting the Lord Mayor and going to his signing in ceremony at the Royal Courts of Justice. I'm like, should I be here? They're going to find mm -hmm. out I'm that kid from the council estate who didn't get any O-levels, you know? <laughs> So I do feel, I still feel that, mm. Um, mm. but where my comfort zone is, mm. is words, talking, words, speaking to people, listening to people, reading. Mm. Um, and if this condition starts to rob me of that, I will really be out of my comfort zone. Mm. Totally, Martin. Thank you for sharing that. Martin, what was your favorite toy as a child? You're getting these out of a book. <laughs> my favorite toy as a child. Favorite toy as a child. Um, I read. I read. You know, I'd, I'd, yes, I had toys, but books. Um, I, I, I had piles of books, you know, I'd go down the local library with a pile of books and I'd pick up another pile of books and I'd just read them from cover to cover. Mm. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit like, you know, parents today say they're trying to get their kids to put their screens down and go out and play. My, par my parents were trying to get me to put my book down to go out and play. <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah, words have always been my thing. Do you have any favorite book, Martin, or do you relate yourself to a book character that, ah, that character looks like Ooh. me? I read book. Um, when you read so many, all sorts of different genres, but I think a book I'll return to again, again and again and again mm. is, um, is Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. I, the storytelling. The, the pictures that he paints, that life, the excitement, the fun. I, 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 I just love that. And maybe Mr. Pickwick then, if I'm going to pick a character. Um, he, he, was a bit of a, he was a bit of an old fool, um, but he had a heart of gold. <laughs> nice. So who haven't you seen or talked to in a long time, Martin, and you hope that they're doing okay? That's... I mean, one of the lovely things, again, about new technology and COVID, and I'm sure lots of people have, have said it, this stuff is brilliant. You know, mm -hmm. I've met and talked with all sorts of people. My sisters and I 
have started a, a, a monthly conversation. We only ever used to speak to one another at Christmas and holidays. Uh, mm -hmm. we, this stuff has got us in touch with all sorts of people. So I'm, I'm not sure that there's a, a, a particular individual that I pick out. If I had the magic wand to catch up with people, it would be all those people in my FM teams over the years. Mm. You know, we had so I had some wonderful teams with brilliant people, cleaning supervisors, security managers, um, FMs, and 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 others. Um, and you know, at times our the teamwork that we had going was 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 like a family. Um, you know, when you've got a good team and it's going really well, um, it would be wonderful to know that all of those people are all right and uh, how they are and, you know, whether they progressed in their careers. There are a few individuals that I know who went on to great things, um, becoming managing directors and leaders in our industry who, who worked for me somewhere back along the way. But all of those others, you know, that, that would be a nice thing. Mm. Hundred percent, Martin. Martin, if you could in if if you could be invisible for a day, what would you do? Ha. Told you I was a reader. Have you read The Invisible Man by H. G. Wells? Um, yeah, it's understand. a great, it's a, it's a great book. And what it proves is being invisible, unless you've got some other superpowers, is absolutely useless. Um, <laughs> Because as soon as you go outside, you get knocked down by a car. Um, you follow somebody into a room, they close the door, you're stuck in there until somebody else opens it. You know, being invisible is no good for you. And I've got to tie that back to FM. You know, that's one of the problems we've got in FM. Our people are invisible. Um, and that's the last thing we need them to be. Don't be invisible. I hear FM sometimes say, I know it's going right if nobody's noticed us. Well, no, if nobody's noticed you, there's something definitely going wrong. You need to be um, your own marketing department. We need to um, tell people, you know, we are here and the value and the service that we are providing and how we can help them and what we're doing for the organization as well as, 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 well as for the individuals. Being invisible is, is a waste of time. Don't be invisible. Nice, Martin. Well said there. Martin, do you have any favorite sports? And uh, if you have a choice to play a sport, which sport would you like to play, Martin? I used to play golf um, mm. badly. Um, unfortunately, my balance and uh, muscle issues mm. mean it got even worse. <laughs> um, I'd, uh, I'd love to be back playing golf again, um, but that's not going to happen. Um, I like to watch football, um, and uh, I followed Watford from the uh, the nineteen sixties you know, through, you know, from being at the bottom of uh, the football pyramid all the way through to uh, today in the Premiership, um, or maybe not today where we're struggling a bit this 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 season. But you know, we've established ourselves as a Premiership club over the last few years, and that that's been brilliant, um, and. Uh, I go to your game with my son um, and uh, yeah, I love me football, but not, I can't play. Um, I, I exercise a lot, or I'm trying to, um, but that's because things are stiffening up and slowing down. Yeah, I think we all have to, Martin, but uh, well, it's great that you are keeping yourself occupied. Martin, what's your favorite food? Uh, if you are being asked to make a special dinner for a guest, what food would you cook for them, Martin? Oh, I do like to cook. Mm. Um, uh, 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 and uh, in fact, I do most of the cooking here in the house. Um, the, um, what would I know? Although I've, I, I, I can make, I can do all sorts of, fancy food um and i've got a particularly good chicken korma um but um a good english beef roast mm. um with all the trimmings um if if if, if i want to impress somebody the table would be laden with uh, homemade gravy and 
Yorkshires and beef and vegetables galore. So yeah, that would be that. God, nice, Martin. I hope I visit you one day for this nice chicken korma that you talked about or anything. <laughs> Um, Martin, I think, do you listen to music? What pop group or which type of music would you give a perfect 10? Um, I've, so, you know, back, back to me in the 60s, this long-haired kid who um, going to music festivals, um, I, I, I have a very um, eclectic taste. I like all genres of music as mm. long as they're played well. You know, mm. so there's, there's, good pop and there's plastic pop there's good rock and there's plastic rock um uh i listen out for the words as you might have gathered there's a recurring theme so my favorite performers are are people who, who, who effectively are poets as well um so uh i don't know yesterday i was listening to, to an old lou reed album um this morning i was listening to a an there's a new young band in in manchester called yard acts that i really really like um uh on my shelf of cds um, which of course never ever get played anymore so that's another bit of technology that i've spent a lot of money on but it's, it's never gonna get used. i've probably got more albums by richard thompson than anyone else um mm. uh, if you know richard thompson ace guitarist folk musician um so yeah wide range of music love music nice martin nice Martin, if you could go back to history uh, and uh, live a life in the past, uh, which period would you like to go, Martin, and why? Oh. Um, I suppose, I don't know. I almost want to turn it back and say, you know, The period of my life when I had most fun was the 1960s. Mm. Um, and I, 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 to forever be in the 60s would be great. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when I look, when I look further back, um, you know, mm. Victorian age, you know, the age of, um, of, of engineering and innovation. Yeah. That's good, isn't it? My ringtone is a Richard Thompson song. <laughs> um, if I, if I, um, you know, Victorian age, uh, wonderful age of innovation and creativity, but for the working class, it was pretty awful. Um, and the same as you go back in, in, in history, you know, the social injustices, the, 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 the working class people, um, different sex, gender, race, face, you know, they've never been as good as that, you know, they've never had as good a position as they, as they have now. Mm. Uh, I know it could be better. I know we've got so much more to do. Um, but, you know, back in history, I'm not sure I'd want to be back in any of those times where, you know, before the NHS, before um, the... Uh, before we were allowed to own homes, before we were allowed to um, keep the earnings that we, you know, and so on. So, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry, 1960s, I'll give you. Sure, Martin. Martin, who are the people who have been the most influential in both your life and also in your long career? Uh, my dad. Mm. Um, we weren't close, um, and I tried hard in later life to, to, to earn his respect. I've never quite been sure whether I achieved it, but he was a perfect model of hardworking, kind, fair, um, uh, inclusive, you know, in a time when um, that wasn't the everyday. Um, he would not allow people to, my, my, in, in, the, in the 1970s, right at the height of the worst racism um, activity in this country, my, my sister married a, uh, a, a Jamaican guy. Um, 
my mum and dad welcomed them into their home. You know, I mean, I, 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 I admired that hugely. Um, so yeah, he was kind, hardworking, very hardworking um, and fair. Um, I mentioned Oliver Jones, you know, career-wise, Oliver, his part, he's in my paths crossed several times as clients and suppliers, as partners. Um, we ran Cytex together. We ran Asset Faculty, our training company. We ran that together. Um, his attitude to creativity and innovation, um, really, really impressive. You know, there's never a barrier. There's always another way. Um, and actually, I use that now in the position I find myself now in with, with Parkinson's. You know, I could fight it, but what's the point in fighting? Accept it, find a way of dealing with it. That's that's the way to um, to do stuff. So I, I think I learned that from Oliver, um, and and one you might not expect from my list, Tony Benn, the politician. Um, I knew Tony through uh, my own activism, um, and I think um, you know there are there are, there are particular lessons I learned from him, but he was you know despite say despite being brought, born into privilege. Um, and, um, uh, you know, a peerage and all, all, all that stuff. He was um, one of the, you know, the absolute model of someone who truly believed in and fought for constantly social justice, ethics, principles, kindness, you know, would never always stop and talk to anybody. Um, great man. Le learned a lot from him. I've lost you. Because I muted myself, Martin. <laughs> so anybody else in your life, Martin, other than Tony and Oliver? And Carrie? Well, my dad, Tony, Oliver. Um, I mean, lots and lots of people along the way. You learn a lesson from this person. I've told you I'm keen on, you know, I believe in self-learning um, and continuous learning. So every time you deal with someone, even people you don't like much. Um, I had a boss once that I got on very um i did not get on with at all well i won't name them um i found them very challenging and unreasonable um but i'm surprised how often i look back on things he said to me and i and there are learning points from it mm. you know actually he was right about that he was right about attention to detail he was right that i hadn't thought that through properly <laughs> he was right that you don't need to boil the ocean um I mean, uh, and another politician, um, uh, Neil Kinnock, gave me a good talking to once. Um, uh, I was getting very um, fired up about the injustices that were happening in, um, in, in Chile at the time. You remember the Chilean junta and people being, and I was, you know, what are we gonna do? We need, to, we need a march, we need to demonstrate. We need, um, and Neil was kind of, not in a patronizing way, but he was, You've got an old people's home near you um, the, the, that's got a bus stop outside that hasn't got a shelter. You could get a shelter. <laughs> you probably can't get this Chilean junta to stand down, but you could help the people in that old people's home. Mm. Um, and, you know, do stuff you can do. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, Never do nothing and never just words. Do stuff. Make make a difference. Um, I tried tried to tried to adopt that one too. Hasn't made me rich. <laughs> As the one person told me, uh, long yep. time, Martin. I, I know you will always attract people who's not rich, but with somebody with a big rich heart and. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter. You are all, you'll always be a superhero for us, Martin. So let's uh, let's continue. Martin, last two questions before we close the episode, Martin. What's the best piece of advice you have received and from whom? Uh, I probably just gave you that. <laughs> but if there is anything else that you would like, because I know you had a good story with Oliver and also with uh, uh, Neil, anything else? Or you could spin it off to just say, what advice would you give any aspirant, FM aspirant, who is looking to pursue a career similar to yours? 
in in terms of that advice that I give people coming into to do FM, I'm not sure there. I'm not sure you can have nowadays a career like mine where you, where, where you go from the mailroom to CEO. Um, uh, I like to think that you can, um, but perhaps the the big big service providers now. I think maybe that's difficult to do. Um, but there's definitely, you know, facilities is a career where um, ordinary people um, who perhaps haven't got a university degree um, can work their way into management, work their way into leadership roles, um, can make a difference. Um, and if they want to, um, there are different measures of success, of course, but if they want to progress um, up the ladder, um, then I think my number one advice is keep moving around. Um, mm. You know, work supply side, work customer side, work in the finance industry, work in the manufacturing industry, work as a consultant, work as a work as a, an operational person, try some time in business development, do some work overseas. Um, I think you know that 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 point about you have to decide in FM if you're going to be a specialist or a generalist. Mm -hmm. um, nothing wrong with being a specialist. If you want to be a specialist in space planning, um, you, could be, you could become the best space planner in the country and, and, and make, set up your own company and make a fortune. You know, that's, of course, you can be successful that way. But if you want to succeed as FM, you've got to be, you've got to know as much as possible about that amazing multiverse that, that is facilities management and you will gain the respect of the people you work for and the people you um, uh, are, are, are serving if you have that broad knowledge and broad experience so you know I, 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 I get very frustrated when people come to me for career advice and they show me their CV you know and it says facilities manager for a bank move to become facilities manager for an insurance company, move to become facilities manager for another bank. And I'm like, you know, every job you do has got to add value to you. It's mm. got to be something where you learn something new and you increase your value to the people who are going to employ you or pay for your services in the future. Um, so that's one piece of advice. Then then the second piece of advice, which is probably more important, is remember the people. Oh. Yeah. FM, you know, those 50 years that I talked about, you know, and technology features heavy, heavily, in each of them, we were having to make massive adaptations to the way we dealt with FM because the technology changed. And that's happening again at the moment. Um, but in all of them, you know, there were cleaners, mm -hmm. there were security guards, there were kitchen staff, there were porters. Um, and yes, we've got, you know, robotics and AI and stuff coming in now, but it's going to be a very, very long time before they actually replace our people, if ever. Um, what they do at the moment is what it's always happened in the past, which is the technology supplements the service that we can provide, enhances it so that we can provide better service. Um, but it's still the people that matter. Um, we're both the people that provide the service and you need to look after them and care for them because they really are hackneyed term our greatest asset although Premier League football clubs are the only people who put them on the asset list in their balance sheet um, but the people we serve it's also about the people we serve again we don't serve the building the building is just there to keep the people dry while they're doing what it is they're trying to achieve our job is to help them achieve what, what you know, make them more productive. Mm. And we must um, sell the story constantly to, to uh, business, government, society, that facilities management makes a difference. We make a difference to productivity. We make a difference to the attract and retention of talent. We make a difference to risk. We make a difference to reputation. Um, we make a difference to the environment. Um, we're not about PPM or, or 
square feet or valve returns. We're about stuff that really, really matters to everybody. Preaching again. <laughs> no, it's, it's super important, Martin. I think as, as you rightly said, um, the definition of FM is different to different people and everybody seems to pull it in different directions and they say, this is how it should work. Other person, other company comes and say, this is how it should be procured and so on. So I think the, the advice or inputs that you just gave us is, you know, look at it from the broader aspect and then see what value you're adding. And that's everything, the value that we add is FM. That nice thing. And if you're not adding value, should you be doing it? Exactly, Martin. Well said. Martin, is there any part of your life or career or is there anything else you would like to say to the listeners before we close to the episode, Martin? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I, I've, I've, done my, I've done my preach. Um, I, again, you know, the, the new generation of facilities people, yourself included, um, fill me with, with great hope. Um, and another Tony Ben quote, hope is the fuel of progress. Mm. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we, you will move it forward. You will take FM onto another level. Um, and um, I look back, I look forward to uh, being around for a while, keeping my eye on what's happening and uh, enjoying seeing what you all achieve. Thank you, Martin. Thank you so much for your kind words, Martin, and also joining and sharing with you, your family, all the good health and happiness continue to inspire us. And I'll definitely speak to you very soon, and there will be a part three as well to listen <laughs> very soon. So Martin is not going anywhere. He's just going to share it even more to us in the coming weeks, months. Thank you, Martin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. It's a great idea.